Welcome back. We are, this is still a part of us and we're so excited to chat with Sharon about her daughter Ivy and how the grief process has looked the last six years, almost seven years. And if you get a chance to listen to her birth story of Ivy, um, please do. I, my mouth was open like a good chunk of the time I was so, uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a sweet and tender story. Um, also very surprising at times. So, so thank you, Sharon, for being so kind to share that story of your daughter. In a nutshell, can you tell us what happened to her when she was born? Sure. Um, Ivy is our third child and she was born at 40 weeks unexpectedly at home Yes, and had passed from a cord accident. Yeah. And like we were talking about earlier is that it's been, it'll be almost seven years in just a, a, a month or so, a month and a half or so um, at the yeah. time of this recording. So thank you for coming on. Cause that's, we were talking just right before we start hit record is that, you know, we don't sometimes get people that have had some time since their loss. And so let's kind of disassemble how that grief has morphed over time. Tell me how yeah. it was at the very beginning and then how it's changed over, over the years. Uh, the very beginning, right after she was born, um, was a huge fog. I was on autopilot taking care of my two living children and um, right away coming home. It was very important for me to, I think when I find out about something, I do what I can to kind of research it from a logical point of view. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it was very important for me to, like I was online and I was trying to find other people that had gone through the same thing. And I guess just for proof of life, like how did they survive after something like this, something so devastating happened? Um, and it was just so special to read other babies' stories and to hear kind of about their short lives. So I, in the beginning, spent a lot of time reading about other babies mm -hmm. and other families that had gone through this. I did join a support group through my um, hospital that I was at that I believe they met once a month. And it was for specifically bereaved parents that have lost a baby either during pregnancy or in the first year after birth. And that group talk therapy was just really crucial in letting me kind of process through some of the emotions and feelings that I was having. I did also find a personal therapist for myself that I saw in the beginning once a week just to kind of process through everything with her story. I historically have been a person that kind of bottles things up and tries mm -hmm. to figure it all out myself. Yeah. So I feel like in the time after Ivy was born, I mean, I was outwardly grieving, but I also think I kind of processed a lot of it myself. I didn't really, I went, I hold into myself instead of necessarily, I feel like in some ways my husband and I at the time, we were kind of like ships passing in the wind. Like he was able to take care of the helping with the house things and we did still, you know, sometimes sit with each other or whatever to share the loss. But I feel like a lot of my own grieving was done either in my support group or with my therapist yeah. or kind of just internally with myself. Did uh, So you just went to the support group by yourself? You didn't go he with? He went uh, the first time or two with okay. me. Uh -huh. um, and it just, I think it was... It was not, not necessarily his... helpful for him, but it yeah. was really helpful for me. Yeah. So then we just kind of split. I mean, gotcha. we were still together at that point in time, but I was the one that was going to the support group. Yeah, because and... that was helpful for you. So, yeah. That right. Makes sense. Correct. Because it is so, it's so hard to grieve and yeah, just be on the same page sometimes with, with uh, right. your partner. <laughs> um, and through the support group, I knew because the, the support group was done through my intended hospital. So yes. it was the hospital that my midwives were at. And that was a hospital that at the time did not have a cuddle cot. So yes. I knew that if it was possible for me to fundraise for a cuddle cot, I mean, at the point in time, I don't think I thought that I was going to be able to fully fund one because they're expensive. They are. But um, I set up a fundraiser and we were able to pull together the funds to purchase a cuddle cot for her intended hospital. So now that they have one for other babies, but that whole process from like fundraising to you know, actually being able to provide one for them took a handful of months and then you place the order and it still has to go through. So it was kind of a process. Um, so during that time, I was working pretty closely with the woman who she's a nurse at the hospital, but she heads their still missed program, Oh, which is like their support group that they have for yeah. women and families that are in this situation. Um, 
So we were able to do that sometime within the first, I want to, I don't remember exactly. It was sometime within the first year after she was born. That's awesome. Um, and then I think I did the support group through the hospital pretty regularly for the first year to year and a half, maybe. Um, and then after that would still go periodically, like if I felt like I could benefit from it or if mm -hmm. I felt like I needed to go. So for the first couple of years, I was still a stay at home mom. My kids were still pretty small. Mm -hmm. So I was doing the support group. And then at one point in time, like, so when it was time for me to get back involved with, you know, going back to work myself, I felt like I was ready to do that couple of years after she was born. So, okay. you know, by the time my son was four or five, he was in preschool. I had some more chunks of time to myself. Um, but that kind of was its own conundrum because I worked in women's health before. Oh, yes, that's right. And I had my babies. And I really, even two years out, still felt like I was at a place where right. I wasn't ready to yeah. immerse okay. myself back in a world where people are having live babies because yeah. I mean, obviously from my line of work, like I know that people have live babies and that sometimes they don't, but yeah. I was still pretty bitter about that. Yeah. Um, then that kind of changed into a full career change because that was my career. And now what am I going to do? Right. Um, I ended up starting out with working part-time at my children's elementary school just mm -hmm. because that fit well with schedules. Yes. And yeah has migrated to where now I'm still at the elementary school. Um, I'm actually working as a special education teacher assistant. Oh, great. So um, my career path has changed, but uh, I think it kind of needed to. I feel like I'm where yes. I need to be and I'm functioning okay. And Yeah, I think I would have a hard time going back into that field as well. I, I, I've always astounded. We've interviewed a couple of la labor and delivery nurses right. who had babies at, in their, in their department. And right. they went, they had to take a step back for a time in order to function properly again, if that makes sense. So yeah, I sure. and I'm still amazed by the ones that go back to it. Cause exa I exactly. don't think that I could, like there was a while for a while, before Ivy was born, I was thinking, you know, maybe becoming a doula would be something mm. that I could do with my life because I was totally about like the yeah. pregnancy, birth, breastfeeding, like all of that was kind of in my wheelhouse. Yeah. But um, it was a necessary shift because I just maybe have my own unresolved things that I still can't get past with my own uh, last experience of birth. Anyways, so there's, that. Yes, there's <laughs> career change and kind of life moved forward um funny enough and it's probably just the difference in personalities of my children but i feel like my son who was newly 2 when ivy was born mm -hmm. talks more about her than my daughter who so now i mean he's now 9 yeah she's now almost 13 yeah and they both do still talk about her but her significantly less than my son does. Like my really? son will be the first one that, you know, when the son comes in, he's like, oh, Ivy's saying hi to us. Oh. And we do, we did some things. So that first year um, when it was coming up to her first birthday, we got together with my parents and brother and my husband's parents and brother and um, our children and just had dinner. Um, we lit a candle for her and kind of had like a family dinner um, yeah. every year, even still. We get like a little cupcake or a nothing bunt cake. Yeah. And sing happy birthday to her. Um, I have what I call our Ivy Bear, and it's actually from a company called Molly Bears. Yes. I don't know if you've heard of them mm -hmm. or not. Yep. They, yes. They're awesome. <laughs> yeah, they're awesome. So I have my pink Molly bear that's five pounds, 12 ounces, yep. just like she was. And so we put a little birthday hat on our Molly bear and we so sing sweet. happy birthday to our bear and blow out candles. Um, and we still, so it'll be seven years next month. And we still, that's what we do for her yep. birthday. Um, it's not so necessary. Like we don't necessarily purposely get together with our extended family to do that, but definitely the four of us. And yeah. even though we are now divorced, like my ex-husband joins in with that too. And we get together and sing happy birthday to her. When we were coming up to her fifth birthday, yeah, 
it was important for us. Like I was just feeling the pull, like I needed to do something again in her name. So I set up a fundraiser and raised enough money to provide our intended hospital. Or wait, no, wait, I got that wrong. The support group, the hospital that the support group is affiliated yes. with, uh-huh. we um, fundraised because the woman who takes care of that still missed program. I'm still in semi-regular contact with her. And mm-hmm. so closer to Ivy's fifth birthday, I reached out and was like, hey, I'm feeling like I want to do something to support your program in honor of Ivy. What could be something that you have right now as a need? So we fundraised and provided a Polaroid camera along with a good supply of film so that oh. for other parents that are in the hospital, they have like an actual physical hard copy of a photo that they can hold. Yes. Yes. To go home with, because you, when you leave that hospital, you're not leaving with a baby. So, yep. and whatever pictures and stuff you have, you still have to get those printed out yep. or whatever. So if you could have... So it was really special that we were able to do that for them. Um, That's cool. Yeah. Because that is really nice to have something physical. Yeah. Because we had to wait to get all the pictures. Right. Um, So that felt necessary. And I don't know that I'll always feel a pull to do something, but it's nice to know that I am connected with a couple of groups that when the need for myself to do something in her name comes, I can can find proper avenues to do that through. Yeah. When we had our son's fifth birthday come along this year, those milestone birthdays, they're just like, they come out of nowhere and you just feel like, oh, there's, there's, it feels like pressure. Cause you're like, he would be going to kindergarten. It was like, right. yeah, I, I don't know if that's what you felt too, but I was just like, this is, he would start school. Like this is a big deal for us. So yeah, that's the strange thing about that. Like forward grieving is that you yeah. don't anticipate like, oh, I'm going to miss the yeah. five-year-old her and you know yeah. there's I live in a uh, townhouse and there's a lot of children in mm. like on our street specifically and um, a couple of them are the same age as Ivy would be yeah. and so you know kind of bittersweet of oh they're starting kindergarten and she should be starting kindergarten but also I think at almost seven years out now it's a little bit sweeter in that like I mean, when I see those kids outside playing, like it kind of makes me smile a little bit because, oh, like that's, I do believe in heaven. So I kind of, that's what I imagine her, like she's just running around just like they're running around down here. And uh, I know initially I worked preschool last year. So by timeline, she would be in first grade this year. And then this year I'm working with kindergartners and fourth graders. And I wasn't sure at first how it would feel like working with somebody so close to the age that she would be. Uh But in some ways, I kind of feel like it's healing my heart. Like I'm still able to experience that age yeah, just through other children that are not mine. Yeah. I know it's so funny because you think that you're like, I'm never going to be able to get over this or never going to be able to hold a baby again or yeah, be be around kids that are that same age. And and then you're like, no, it's, it, it is kind of fun to see that these kids grow up. Right. And a lot of like, I remember in the earlier months when like right after she had died that I was um, reading about other people's stories. And a lot of times those stories might well cover the first year or even mm-hmm. the first two years. And I remember wondering, well, like what happens after that? Like what, how does it move on or whatever? And I think what I've come to realize is that that ball of grief doesn't get any smaller. It's just that your experiences with the world increase over time so that like that ball of grief is still there and still the same size. But as time passes, I'm able to interact more with the world and come up with like different of my own experiences that in a way, like it kind of makes sense now why those stories have ended you know, a year after, two years after, because I think that grief is still there, but it becomes kind of enmeshed with other parts of your life Mm -hmm. that maybe like, yeah, that's her story, but this part isn't attached to her story or that part isn't attached to her story. It's kind of like your capacity, your capacity has grown. Yes. And it's just coming along for the ride. This grief is, is part of you now and it's who you are. It's, it's your new identity. And and that's okay. I mean, 
there's a sad bit there. <laughs> yeah. And I think Ivy's father and I are no longer married. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were divorced. It's been a little over a year that we've been divorced. Okay. Um, and I think really what just happened, like grief changes people. It changed myself. It changed my then spouse. Mm-hmm. And I don't think in any way that her death like caused our divorce or anything like that. I think that it just was this thing that got added to this pile of stuff that was already there. And I mean, we might've gone our separate ways anyway, Right. that this grief was just kind of a big part of us maybe realizing our incompatibilities in some ways. Interesting. Okay. uh, Sooner. And we still, I mean, we live in neighboring towns from each other Mm -hmm. and we still see each other all the time. And um, he's still one of my best friends for sure. It's just different. (laughs) Yeah. And I, that was one of the questions I was going to ask about how you guys grieved and, and you kind of like indirectly talked about how, you know, you appreciated the talk, kind of the talk group therapy and he's, he went and supported you and, didn't right. feel like that that was something that was helpful for him. And so can you talk a little bit more about how you saw the differences and um, maybe how you supported each other in in the grieving that you guys experienced? I think in some ways, like really what had happened was, I think in some ways we were already on our own autopilots before Ivy was even born. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. my life at home with the kids was different than his life going into an office every day and working. And we, after she was born, we grieved together a little bit, but then I also am kind of a stubborn and internal person anyways. So I think I took a lot of it upon myself. Um, I feel like I've historically been a very strong person and I think my needs changed in that before where I could easily carry our family and be a decision maker and whatever. Like I no longer was able to do that for myself. Yeah. Which that was never the role that my husband had to have in our marriage ever. So that kind of changed, like my needs changed. Yes. A lot, it sounded like. Yeah. And I don't know, it just, I think in some ways grieved so separately that we kind of just continued our separate paths. And by the time we realized that we were on separate paths, that it was just a little bit too late. Yeah. Yeah. Grief does that to you where it just, it seems to um, emphasize, right? Um, Yeah. Maybe what's happening a little bit more. So I am wondering um, if there was anything after, I know you alluded to some of these in the birth episode already. But were there any things that really stood out to you that others did for you that was outstanding and helpful, so helpful from early times all the way till now? Like, is there anything that really stands out that you would maybe encourage others to do if they were supporting somebody that had lost a baby? Yeah, I think, I mean, something tragic happens and a lot of people want to be able to do something, but it's like, what do you do? Do. (laughs) for something this major. Um, and one of the big things was my doula set up a meal train. Yeah. So just in those first early weeks after she was born, knowing that a couple of times a week, we had somebody bringing us a hot meal that would feed our family because I was able to go through the motions of taking care of our household and our family. But I mean, preparing meals and stuff was so far on my back burner that um, we probably did a lot of takeout and a lot of yep. uh, mac and cheese and things yep. of that sort. But uh, it's the bare minimum being, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Being fed was yes. like huge. And I find myself even still now, like when something major happens for somebody else in my circle of friends or family, like that's kind of my first go to is, well, I can feed them. Yes. I can make something for them and at least feel like they're. Um, being taken care of in that way. Yeah. And then I feel like even now, six, almost seven years out, like the smallest things make the biggest impacts. Like knowing that I'll still hear my mom or my mother-in-law say her name. Mm -hmm. Um, My children occasionally will still bring her up or even just like, I guess 
exterior signs. Um, I, after she was born, when we uh, were getting flowers and stuff for her casket, I really wanted to have Ivy on her, ca- yeah. <clears throat> on her casket. And uh-huh. since the time that she's been born, I've you know acquired some plants and stuff in my house. And I have Ivy that is hanging in my house now. And I have Ivy from her casket that I planted outside in my yard. Oh, and that has kind of flourished now. So it yeah. kind of just makes me smile every time I see that because I've got that as like a ground cover right. in my yard now, um, along with like a little statue that we have for her. That's like a resin statue mm-hmm. of a angel baby sleeping. And so just things like that have been like I associate the sunshine with her and yeah. I associate and that came from I don't remember the exact story, but I think I did explain it a little better on my blog. I mm-hmm. blogged right after she was born for probably yeah. the first year or so. And that really helped me process through my feelings. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so this was shortly after she was born, uh, maybe like the first week or two. And I was sitting on my couch and I just remember being really upset and just kind of devastated by the whole situation. And I don't remember at the time I might have been talking. I was either talking to my husband or maybe talking to my son, but just kind of talking a little bit, processing through my feelings about how I was feeling. And then all of a sudden, so it's still middle of winter, but Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, this really bright sun comes shining through the window and it's just warm and bright sunshine. And since then, I've always said that like a bright sunshine, just I associate that with her. And it was funny because even, I mean, it's really overcast here right now, but even when I was talking to you for the previous episode, Mm -hmm. like all of a sudden this really bright sun came in through the window. Yeah. And it was right before you were talking about when she was getting bored. Like it was, yeah, yeah, like I was like, whoa, that was cool. (laughs) Yeah. That's Ivy. That that's her. Yeah. I think that is cool to, to see her, to see her in places and, and know that feel like she's close. So. Yeah, she's close and it's, I'm thankful. I mean, I don't want to jump too much into faith stuff, but I was raised Christian mm-hmm. and just that no, like it, with my faith of knowing that I will see her again someday has really, I think, helped me yeah. process through a lot of this. And there was a lot of kind of back and forth with questioning my faith, but yeah, ultimately knowing or believing that someday I will see her again. Yes. It's comforting. Yeah. Sunday will arrive, right? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of on the flip side, is there anything um, that people said or did that is was not as helpful during the grieving process? Not to point anybody out or anything, but was there anything that um, eh, maybe to stay away from for a little bit? <laughs> is is well, how I like to put it. <laughs> I mean, I feel like it's just the cliche. Like people are well-meaning and yes, like to say, sure. well, you know, there's a purpose for everything and yes. something good will come of this. But I feel like that comment is not at all helpful to no. somebody that's new in their loss yeah. of trying to navigate through this because, I mean, I feel like even now, like I cannot think of a good reason that a baby should die. Yeah. <laughs> like that's just one of those cruel things of this world. And it's not helpful to say, well, there's a purpose or I think the best thing that people have done and could do is to hold space and say, you know, I might not understand what you're going through and probably hopefully never will understand what you're going through, but I'm here to listen. And if you want to talk about it, and I find myself even reaching out to other moms that are newer in their lost journey. And just like, if you want to talk about your baby, I would love to hear their story is kind of where I sit with things. And I think that even this far out is what everybody wants to hear. Because if somebody like with us talking right now, if I get a chance to share my story and Ivy's story with somebody else, like I hope that that is as healing for other people as it is for my own heart to be able to talk about her. Yeah. I, and I know it is like, there are so many people that reach out to us and say, thank you for sharing because it makes a huge difference. Sharon, thank you so much. It has been delightful chatting with you getting to know Ivy and your family. I appreciate your um, your candor that you spoke about of things that what the grief has looked like and, and some of the, the toughness that is part of it. Like it, there, it is hard. It is very, yeah. very hard. Is there any last little bit of advice that you would like to give or um, anything you want to say about Ivy? 
because I always like talking about our kids. So I don't know. I guess I just, though I don't think there's a reason that these things happen, I think that there is still hope as, mm. you know, stick through it and process through it. And it's not always going to hurt as much as it does in the beginning. Thank you, Sharon. That was perfect. I, your words Thank are you. perfect <laughs> for that. So thank you again for sharing Ivy's story and, and thank you for coming on and chatting with me today. Yeah. Thank you for having me.